Um, I want to begin by saying I'm really, I'm really um, interested in, in these ideas about effective labor and, and in some ways have been kind of skirting around the subject in, in, in a number, in a couple of works, collective works actually, that I've been involved in, um, a collection of essays called Culture Works and, and the work I did with Toby in Global Hollywood where we were trying to, you know, elaborate a, a number of ways in which um, work and labor needs to be reconceptualized away from this idea of something that's um, uh, productive for the, for the uh, profit-making, for system-serving kinds of, of institutions and look more at some of the ways in which labor, which we don't normally recognize as labor, like the reading of a text or the watching of a television program, thinking about um, you know, your, your, you know, your interpretation of a film. All of these things, uh, in some ways, are what we consider to be labor. And I, and I think, you know, I haven't thought about it in terms of the, uh, the emotional investment in, into this, but the, effect, the idea of an effective labor or, or a passionate labor is a really interesting one to kind of bring out through these other works that we've been, we've been doing. One of the things that, that, uh, that Angela brought up was this idea of it being illegible and, and for, for me, and this is where I, I guess my attraction to more of the big institutions comes into play, is that, the, that this kind of labor is illegible in, in the established political economy in terms of legislation, as she mentioned, regulation, in terms of the way organizations and, and this rich uh, uh, study that, that Angela's doing, the on-the-ground sort of sociology of the work itself, sometimes these microeconomies aren't quite recognized and, unless they're represented by union institutions that can go to play an important role against other large institutions. So it's really important to think about the, 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 the reason why they're illegible, why institutions don't see them, and perhaps the relationship between illegible forms of labor. What? I need to stand? Turn it up? It's not on? I think it's really important, though, to, to look at some of the questions of political struggle to make this labor legible. I'm not satisfied myself and would be interested in talking more to Angela about this, but I'm not satisfied myself with, and comfortable with it remaining below the radar. I think that representation is very important. And, and how would one redefine uh, this uh, uh, informal economy or the work in this informal economy to bring it to these larger institutions so that they can actually, again, renew the, the welfare safety nets that have been taken away in the neoliberal period of privatization and the movement of, of the safety net into the family home and the domestic space. Um, what I want to do is to kind of elaborate more on the idea of, of effective labor. And to do that, I guess I need to embody a little bit more about what's happening in, in, in the sector of the creative economy myself uh, and how that's affecting women. Uh, you probably noticed I'm not a woman, so I'm trying to like gonna do a little performance here by reading something. I found a thread on something called a geek sugar, and uh, I don't know if um, you're aware of this, but the uh, European Union is very concerned about the lack of, of women in the IT industry, and they, they want to uh, develop, uh, you know, an educational foundation in order to get more women into IT, into the information technology sector. Um, Europe needs 300,000 female workers in its industry by 2010. So if you were thinking about a, you know, a job and a career kind of goal, this may be where you want to go. Um, but a lot of the uh, discussion revolves around, well, you know, it's a gendered issue and it's really a boys club. And I thought this was very f uh, fun when I started to read it. So uh, here's a little thread. Um, can you hear me? Should I just hold this up to my mouth? Is this okay? Because I can't hear myself. So <laughs> the question came up, what are you going to do? And she says, I'm majoring in history because it's less geeky. That's so stupid. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to get into the role. I'm going to get into the role, and then you know, hopefully, you'll see where I'm taking effective labor to try to, you know, create some sort of co uh, sense of, of the connections and solidarity that might be uh, uh, cultivated. This is why I was involved with the event. Anything to grow the ranks of girl geeks. I have a tech job, and I think it's pretty great. Shuffles feet. I was trying to figure that out. Oh, please give me a break. It's a well-known fact that in engineering IT, how hard it is to get into Google and how much of a boys club it is. I already started in that party in college. I'm not prepared to do it all over again. I don't think it's too geeky. <laughs> I just don't have the skill set for it. Again, the skill set has been a very important part of this creative industry, but if you want to get the job, 
It has to be something re that I really enjoy. Here again, the passion. Information technology is so broad, too, making it less appealing since you can't really picture yourself doing it. The image, where you are in this, the passion. I actually think a tech job would be fantastic, but it's not for me. Like Bereshite, I don't have the right skills for a field. That's another the previous. Uh, besides, I don't think I'd ever be able to give up pursuing a career in biology. I love it far too much. 300,000 jobs by the year 2010. I have a tech job at a school and is the best job ever. Women shouldn't be afraid to get into the tech industry. We have two women and three men in the department. Smile. A little smiley face. And it's just fantastic. Again, you know, it's sort of wonderful to, to think that there's some sort of Mary Tyler Moore thing going on here where they actually, they live where they work. I have a tech job in my office. They, male upper management, are a lot, the they again, are a lot tougher on the women they interview, especially the college recruit. I'm not sure I want to take a job, uh, take up doing, uh, I'm not sure what I want to take up doing. My boyfriend wants me to get a job working at the navigation, at the night vision company, sorry, he's uh, got a job with. I like to joke that I should be able to find a job no matter what, and so on. Um, this is a very interesting, evil dork girl, uh, was an art major too. A very interesting little thread about what kind of skills and how exciting it is to go back and learn HTML and XML and you know all these other languages that they're going to have to learn in order to become part of this new creative economy. Uh, Geek Sugar is the site if you're interested in following up uh, on the, um, the thread. I do this to begin to talk about how effective labor it actually creates a connection between, uh, uh, of course these are not people who are working in the same area, but uh, a sense that there's a kind of solidarity to be built across uh, uh, diverse lines of identity, diverse lines of location and place, that effective labor is not just something that's productive in the space of, of the workplace, whether it's in the fashion industry or IT, but that, and, and that it can be productive for capital, but as Angela was searching for ways in which it is not productive for capital, I, I still think that the effective labor is circulating. It, it is out there. It is a cohesive feature of what, of what links people to other, um, uh, other constitutive parts of, of the system. And you know whether or not they're supporting what political party depends on how that effective labor has been cultivated. In a lot of ways, this is much bigger than just the sectors we're talking about here. It has a lot to do with how uh, uh, the resonance machines of capitalism operate and have been successful to, to mobilize affect, especially with, you know, during the Bush years and the, the years of this Republican resurgence. Um, but what we're talking about here is the creative industries. We're talking about how the creative industries um, are built on a number of different uh, characteristics. And, in, and today, uh, what I want to do is to kind of introduce some of my work, which you may or may not have read yet since I'm sort of on the spotlight tomorrow um, with the uh, subject of the uh, ecological ethics and, and media technologies. I'm going to sort of slide some of these issues in today into the discussion about effective labor and, um, and begin to try to link some of these questions about solidarity, not only across different lines of identity, different spaces, but also between the global north, the global south, uh, and these kinds of uh, divisions that were brought up today in this discussion. Um, one of the thing, one of the goals that I have is to see this, is to press the discussion about media technologies and creative industries to be much more ethically aware, to, to, um, to be more ethically sensitive, to develop an ethos of understanding and respect for the different sectors involved and not to narrow, narrowly focus on the, the question of, of jobs and, and employment and uh, where we're going to play a role in that. And you'll see once you read, when you start to talk about this um, media technology and ecological ethics that we have a lot to uh, account for in terms of the use of these tools which are essential for the development of these, of these products in the creative industry. Um, I have a different, I have a little slideshow that I want to show you that, I, that will help me at least um, bring some of these issues into focus. Um, to begin to get you to think about effective labor in the cultural industries or creative industries, I want you to think about the labor that's that's happening across the world in the production of the media technologies. Here's a picture of a plant where some, uh, some young women are working building the, um, 
the um, printed circuit boards that you'll find in everything. How many people have a cell phone? Don't take them out, but you know. You have a cell phone, you have a computer, you have a, a phone at home, you have a stereo system, you have a, a wireless thing. They all have printed circuit boards in them, and they probably weren't made in this country. But they do facilitate the, um, the, the life of the creative industries. Without them, you wouldn't have the creative industries, and you wouldn't have the cultural industries. Without these women, you wouldn't have the cultural industries or creative industries as we know them now. My point, first point, is that we're not talking about a post-industrial period of of uh, information or knowledge economies. We still haven't gotten there yet. Um, first issue of affective labor. How can we take our sympathies and our care for um, each other across these boundaries and across these, uh, these lines of identity? Well, from the point of view of uh, the corporate uh, boardroom, it seems to be a difficult uh, problem. But here we have again another image of the creative industries which is probably much more familiar to us the the leaders of of the uh, first world of IT um, and this of course are uh, this is just a kind of iconic image uh, that I drew up but here they are happy uh, clean um, no odors <laughs> no heavy metals um, no toxic chemicals um, no electromagnetic radiation just wonderful happy rich. Um, the factory line has been one place where we see, obviously, um, the basis of our creative industries. Here we have a glowing factory of cathode ray tube production from the 1950s. Uh, very beautiful sh picture, I think, mm -hmm. actually. Um, again, uh, again, what we see here is the, you know, the connection, the, 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 the sympathy I have for this woman who's leaning over this um, cathode ray tube, which of course, if you don't know the technology, you will after the end of this week. It's a, it's a ray gun encased in, a, in, in um, uh, lead in glass, between four to seven pounds of lead encased this um, ray gun, which is really shooting x-rays against a, phos a, a screen of phosphorus that lights it up. This is probably not a safe thing to be doing. Um, but it gives us this wonderful screen that we've, um, that we've come to love and see as part of the cultural, you know, basis of, of, of one cultural industry, at least in television, now with computer monitors. But here again is a kind of sterile picture. We don't really, we don't really sense what's happening to this person. And what I, what I want to suggest is that our effective labor, uh, our solidarity, has to be cultivated and stretched again across the point of consumption, the point of design, to the point of, of uh, this particular tool that we use in the industry. Here's a picture of a woman who works at Casio Electronics. Um, and again, this is a picture of the creative industries. Uh, maybe not one you see uh, every day when you think about creative industries, but one I wanted to kind of bring into the discussion because, you know, people get paid. People don't like the wages they make. People protest. And if they if they live in a particular place where you know police can be brought in to, to help you know um, regulate labor this is the kind of image you should uh, understand as part of the creative industries and you know someone told me that when Rick begins to talk it's going to be the big buzzkill for the whole talk about creative industries but what I want to do is to suggest here that again part of the effective labor that we need to cultivate has to have this in mind it has to stretch across not just you know from neighborhood to neighborhood but from country to country, from class to class. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about recycling, but the international trade in uh, used parts, uh, used electronics, is huge um, and becoming a bigger and bigger problem for the countries that are receiving a lot of the technologies that have been thrown away. In the United States, you know, and again, cell phones are a very good example. Um, we, we throw them out every 12 months now, replace them every 12 months. A lot of people keep them in their drawers, but, you know, in case you uh, are not aware about recycling, you probably end up throwing it in the trash or ended up giving it away to somebody who probably threw it in the trash. Tons and tons and tons of electronics uh, reach these, uh, these uh, recycling centers around the world, which are now primarily located in, in China and India with a growing number of them in, in India. Um, again, our affective labor, this effective economy, this economy of passion has to, has to reach out across these boundaries. 
And here is where big institutions matter. There are regulations for the trade in hazardous waste that aren't being implemented and that aren't being enforced, but they exist and um, they're worthwhile to understand and they're worthwhile to to use to make this illegible part of the system legible so that we can begin to talk about solidarity, politics, and larger political economy involved in, uh, in the creative industries. Uh, here a woman is, is dismantling a piece of electronics um, by hand, but will there be more, ex more um, explicit pictures in a second? Back to, uh, back to home base. Um, and, I, you know, I just, I pulled these off the internet yesterday. I'm sorry, I'm being very crass. And, and, and you know, pardon my, my artistic, uh, you know, uh, sensibilities are, are very limited. But I, I tried to juxtapose images that we're familiar with, the happy uh, techno office worker who's well-connected, always connected, and always online. And they have good teeth. <laughs> to the mountain, to the mountain of, of uh, electronic detritus that uh, is now piling up around the world. These uh, components have a number, well, 200 uh, uh, chemical components in each of these telephones, a number of which we know are toxic, but uh, you might have read the, the essay. We don't know what the interaction of these components are. When they take these apart, they try to recover material that can be used again. Um, uh, a number of things can be reused, which is, which is very, uh, very good, but most of them end up in landfills. A lot of it ends up in incinerators. The various chemicals that are, that are burned cause so different problems for the environment, for our health. The ones that are buried cause other problems. It's uh, very complicated, but this is a vocabulary, like the vocabulary of labor, that we need to install in our discussion of the creative industries. What do we know about these chemicals? Maybe we're just designers, or maybe we're just uh, filmmakers, but we need to be aware of this if we're going to see this in an ethical way and cultivate an effective uh, appreciation for this. Uh, again, the recycling in, in, uh, in China um, piles and piles and piles. Uh, the, the division of labor is very interesting here because they're, the, for the most part, uh, done by migrant workers, more and more by, the, by migrants coming to these uh, recycling centers. But a lot of families uh, have built small businesses around these. And again, it's, a, it's an informal economy. It's illegal in China. This is completely illegal. There are official and legal places for recycling. But for the most part, the material reaches China um, uh, uh, you know, sort of through a pirate uh, underground system. And the same could be said for India and, uh, and Africa. And there's competition between these areas to get this business because there's money to be made. The money is made not only in, in just you know, accepting the material and, and selling some of the basic um, components, but also the precious metals that can be derived from these. You can, get uh, tons of gold and, and copper and as you know the current crisis the price of copper and gold are, are going up and silver as well and and these components become a much richer um, a vein of, of precious metals than even the, the uh, primary industry can provide in many cases <laughs> it's more it's more accessible in some cases uh, you may have even read in a number of cases in the United States where uh, people are getting electrocuted because they're going up on, on power lines to get the copper to sell in the open market. It's just that's how bad things are. But again, back to the creative industries, back to our sense of connection with uh, uh, folks who work there on, the, on both ends of the um, uh, production chain. So a woman is melting uh, over an open fire. Underneath there, there's a, there's a charcoal fire. She's melting the components on these circuit boards to try to get the heavy metals out of there for, for sale. You can see in, in the background the uh, buckets and buckets of, of dissembled uh, pieces of um, computers, phones, etc. You can see the open pits. This is China again, um, growing mountains of plastics. Plastics themselves contain um, uh, known carcinogens. Uh, depends how they're disposed of. If they're incinerated, there's one problem. If they're buried, there's another problem. Um, but there always is a problem. Here again, the shops sometimes are enclosed, the fumes gather, the gut dust gathers, and it, it can blow down the street, and, and it's not going to stay in one place, and it's not well contained. Back to home base. Um, this was an era of you know, embrace the atom. Um, I grew up in the 50s, well, I was born in the 50s, grew up in the 60s, and, uh, uh, and Really, uh, it was an era where you were encouraged to um, embrace the atom. I remember having a chemistry set that even had a uh, chunk of uranium in it, and we could play with it. And they would, 
They would give us little droplets of mercury to, you know, mush around in our fingers. Yeah. There was, n you remember that? Yeah. There was no sense then that, that these were poisons. Uh, there was no sense then that these were anything other than a, a, uh, an advance of, of modern technological mm -hmm. society and that the children should just ingest the stuff. We believed that we could turn into the Fantastic Four if we did it. <laughs> um, times have changed, uh, but they change very slowly. And we do have big institutions that are slow to get this when we have um, uh, competitive uh, reasons why a lot of this information doesn't get uh, to these big institutions. But here, the atom, the world. Radium, interesting material, was thought to be um, uh, benign at some point and uh, was included, they would put it in as a component in cosmetics to add that radiant glow that you didn't have when you woke up this morning you could actually become more radiant by putting uh, radioactive material on your skin. <laughs> this is the case of the radium girls. Uh, again, I'm trying to link both historically crossing lines of territory and crossing lines of, of time to try to uh, broaden our sense of the uh, effective economy that we're um, a part of, at least that we can um, use in some ways for our political purposes. You know, the radium girls, uh, there was a big demand by the, from the military for um, uh, watch faces that glowed in the dark, mm -hmm. uh, and they they could glow uh, when you could paint them with this with this radium um, paint, and uh, you know it was a big deal. Um, the radium girls, they were called the radium girls because a very famous case in the late uh, 19 teens uh, involved a number of women who were affected by this and began to get sick. Um, bone, uh, the the hard tissue was becoming soft. They were breaking bones. They were um, finding lesions, um, and it became very clear that this was associated with their exposure to the radium. And they actually filed a lawsuit, which became the basis for a lot of the workplace um, lawsuits that now are, uh, we're very familiar with in terms of uh, workplace safety. Um, they lost the case, and the five who were signed on uh, eventually did, did uh, pass away. Um, but it, it raised a certain alarm about uh, radioactive material uh, in before, even before we had the, the nuclear bomb. Again, workplace, fashion, glowing, uh, uh, you know, wonderful looking uh, watches, all of this stuff, I'm trying to just say, you know, read more into it beyond the, beyond the, um, the uh, surface of the, cult, the creative industries. Um, there's a lot of effort here, and let me just let me just say one thing about Im the immaterial aspects of, of labor. You know, the old Marxists used to talk about the productive labor was the one that was associated with the, um, with the expansion of private property and profit and all of that. Unproductive labor, domestic labor, the feminist critique helped to wake um, the old Marxists up to this. Um, but the important thing about immaterial labor or affective labor or unproductive labor, whatever you want to call it, is that it's not labor without effort. There is effort in all this labor, and that's, I think, an important word to use, maybe even more than labor, is, is work or effort that's involved, uh, whether it's in the, the hidden domestic labor or in the labor that we don't see when we're talking about uh, where our computers go at the end of their, um, well, at that point in their life cycle when we throw them away. Where do they go? What happens to them? Do they just melt into air and come back in another form like some reincarnated uh, machine? Well, no. Well, maybe. Again, back at home base, we have this, uh, again, this is all advertising, obviously. It's presenting a certain idea that we're disconnected from uh, some aspect of the um, products that we use to create um, in these industries, uh, the Floridian industries that we talked about the last few days. Happy office workers, again, I mean, it's tendentious. I know that I apologize, but that's, you know, that's my shtick today. Versus this gaze. Um, You know, I was saying to somebody last night, sometimes, you know, your words fail and you need to have other means to, to express what's happening. Um, and I think just to sort of, uh, you know, sit on this image for a, a minute and, and think about where we get our, our toys, where we get our gadgets, and where we get the tools, the tools of, of this creative labor that we, that we are engaged in. Um, when Angela was talking, I was thinking about my students, and, and when they come to me and they ask me, what am I going to do with my degree in media studies, you know, I can't promise them anything. But I find myself preparing them for the PR, 
you know, how to present themselves, how to write their, their resumes, how to um, learn the tools, uh, the skills set that they're going to need, the multitasking that they're going to need to have to go out to be journalists slash video makers slash uh, video artists, because they ha might have to do all of these things. They might end up being an editor, an assistant editor, and they might not be uh, the filmmaker that they wanted to, to be when they started out. And you have to tell that to them, and you have to say it without apologizing, but that they're here to, to learn these things. How do you teach them, how do you give them an ethical education that's going to make a difference in the way that they use these materials is another thing I think that changes the way we teach. We're not only teaching them how to you know, shape themselves for this, this very precarious industry that they want to go into. And, you know, I live in a media city, and there are lots and lots and lots and lots of different jobs that they could end up doing with this skill set. But what they're going to do in the long run, the political commitments, the ethical commitments that they have in the long run become something that I want to put into this uh, education in the creative industries. And just pondering that, that, that question of solidarity, again, that, that Andrew raised the other day, and this issue of effective labor seems to me to be one way to, to do that, to say that, you know, your work is connected to this work, is connected to that work, and it's, you know, there are reasons to think um, beyond the, the local problems of, of your own job. Mountains and mountains and mountains of, of thrown away materials we have to deal with. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about this tomorrow, but the life cycle of these technologies uh, is, a, is a very interesting thing to think about. And, uh, well, I'll get to that tomorrow. What I really want to focus on today is, is, is the people, the, the bodies, the biology, what's happening to them. To contrast that, again, with uh, the creative industries that uh, Florida and the others are, are presenting to us in this clean, chrome-plated world that doesn't have any, apparently, any odors, any problems, um, and gives us plenty of time for, for leisure and relaxation. I should have gotten some music for this, you know, something, something ominous. <laughs> These are all high-tech, uh, you know, I, I swear to God, these are all high-tech businesses I'm showing you pictures of. <laughs> I'm not cheating. Again, back across, across territorial lines, across different lines of identity, across class lines, across temporal lines, we need to really cultivate and expand this notion of our affect, uh, I think. This I'm trying to make out what it is. I think it might be some sort of gigantic computer. Does anybody know what this is? In any case, it's made her life a lot easier and, and it's facilitated so much. She, she goes home happy every day, probably irradiated. It's a giant air conditioning unit? No, it's a, a high-tech information technology unit. I love this one. Can you make that out? She's on a, on a pile of uh, digital cameras sliding down on some boogie board or something, uh, uh, having a great time. It's, maybe it's a snowboard. Again, the mountains of wonderful technology that we have that support the uh, expansion of the cultural and creative industries in the, the first part of the 21st century, and it is a wonderful thing that's happening to us. But it's not known as anti white guy. No. It, well. it could be, yeah. <laughs> this one is, well, it is in this context. Another mountain, another slide. Perhaps he's having fun, I don't know. <coughs> Again, where do we get these technologies? Who's making these technologies? What are those connections we have with those who aren't present when we're using these technologies? Computing center, perhaps a call center in India. Sorry for the resolution, too. She's such a geek. They have cyber chicks. 
Maquilas. This one is, uh, I think, Tijuana. I like these two. On, on the left is the virtual reality, having a great time. On the right is the one who's doing the real reality of the machine, checking it, making sure all the parts are together. You see the lower left-hand corner is a, um, a little illustration about what it takes to be a, um, a geek girl, high-tech, IT. Laura Croft's in there. Take back the tech. Again, uh, basis for alliance across territorial lines of identity, geographical lines of difference, intergenerational differences, and intragenerational differences, the cultivation of affect and affective labor, it's expansive. It can be shaped, I think, and it can, it can have a, a, a direction which is, is not just productive for capital, but also productive of change in the system. And I think that it's learned. I think that we are, you know, and our students and, and others who work in this area have the, the duty to, in some ways, think about these issues and to install these sensibilities into the, into the, um, into the residence machine, a positive residence machine. I love this one. Our government says, don't waste stuff. This is about bread, but, uh, you know, you can say the same thing about, about the high-tech industry. And this is the last one. Very positive, upbeat, back at home base. So I put that together on the fly, thinking what I was going to say about this, uh, this issue of, of women, technology, uh, labor. Uh, and after um, Angela's terrific paper, I really I didn't, I didn't have much to say. I think, that, I think this is something that's ongoing, and it's prospective. And I think we need to just uh, begin the conversation and, and understand. The political questions are there. The big institutions do have ways to make this eligible labor legible in, that can improve the standards of work in the in the global north, in, in, in uh, Britain and in the U.S. and New York and L.A. Um, it's not all underground. It doesn't have to be informal. Rules and laws are being broken. Those can be enforced to, to bring this to the foreground. We can talk about the workplace hazards, not only where the risks are increased uh, in terms of the, the health and well-being of people working in the, the, um, the creative industries in New York or, or London, but also in solidarity with those whose risks we're displacing to other parts beyond the horizon of, of our own political and local political economy. Uh, I think it was uh, Juan talked about us being a biospherical people. It's very true. And I think to think about the biosphere, to think about the planetary connections, while it sounds kind of goofy and utopian, is the only way to really, um, to, well, to begin to talk about affective labor that's going to lead to these political and economic commitments and ethical commitments that, that some people seem to be concerned about here. So that's all I wanted to say today. I'll have more tomorrow, and I know there might be some questions. <laughs>